There you go. Man. So if whatever questions you want to ask me, I'm, I'm all up for that. Um, okay. And yeah. Well, if you, you know, if something is off, uh, just let me know and I can always cut out the bits and pieces and whatnot. And ah, man. Whatever. I'm an open book. Cool. I'm an open book. I, I don't, I don't even censor or edit myself on, uh, on my YouTube channel. You know, it's all just whatever goes on the camera goes on the camera. I'm like that too. That's, that's something I really appreciate. I think, I think people too often, they try to present a certain image of themselves. And I think that's a shame, especially on public level, because that distorts other people's perception of what normal people are. So yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah, man. Especially with the younger generation, I think, um, you know, the, the YouTube jump cut style video where they edit out every moment of silence, every, every pause has trained younger people to, to change their expectation about how human communication is supposed to work. That's a good point. And actually that, that just made me feel guilty. <laughs> I do that a little bit <laughs> on my vlogs. But not it's, it's not the worst thing in the world, but man, when every other word is a jump cut, that's, that's a bit of a problem. That's a good point. I'll, but... I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I just want to say officially, it's, we're on record. So I wanted to say officially, again, it's just such a pleasure to finally see each other. I mean, it's, we'd be so yeah, awesome. Likewise. I'm sure one day we'll meet. I just have no doubts about that, but this is a great uh, step towards that. So yeah, yeah, man. Every serious martial artist should should come to China at some point, make a pilgrimage. It's kind of odd me saying that since uh, the martial arts community has changed so much there, you know, just in the last 10 years, let alone the last 50 years. Right. I mean, so, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this idea that China is like this mecca of martial arts, the birthplace of Kung Fu, all this sort of stuff. But um, the reality is way different. Right. So much different. But yeah, go ahead. No, actually, that I was about to say, like, please tell more. I'm very curious. I have some ideas sure. about where it is, but, but I'm, yeah. Sure. Well, you know, like, like most Americans who, who grew up watching Kung Fu movies, I had this idea that, that China is this place where you go if you want to learn Kung Fu. Makes sense, right? Because that's where yeah. it's from. Yeah. So when I got here to China, I... It wasn't like my dream to come to China to learn to uh, train in Kung Fu, but I thought, well, I'm going there. So why not? Why not learn some Kung Fu? And I looked everywhere, everywhere. And, and um, at the time in Shanghai, like 10 years ago, there were a couple of very touristy type of um, Wushu schools where they'd show you some forms and charge you a bunch of money and all this stuff and, uh, and not teach you anything about actual fighting. And I was like, ah, I don't think I'm really interested in that. And they had the, the Shanghai University of Sport where you could uh, study like Wushu, Sanda, that sort of thing. And that was like the only place that seemed to have any legitimacy in this area. And I traveled all these other, to all these other cities like uh, uh, Xi'an um, and Beijing. And, and I found the most legitimate Kung Fu was taught at the sports universities. And by legitimate Kung Fu, I mean Sanda, which is Chinese kickboxing, yeah. combat sports. Um, and when I say legitimate, I mean, what actually works in a fight? Because that's what, that's what interests me as a combat sports coach. And I know that that term legitimate might offend a lot of people out there on the internet who, who train in Kung Fu for, um, cultural reasons, who train it because it's, it's something they enjoy and they like to do forms and they never plan on getting into a fight and that's fine. And I don't mean to offend those people, but that's how I'm using this vocabulary, just so people know. Right. Um, so that already uh, leads me to ask. Uh, first of all, you probably know a little bit, at least a little bit about my story. It's the, the fact that I got disillusioned uh, through practicing IQ yeah. for years. And I'm curious, did you go through that process of becoming disillusioned? Or, or were you so clear-headed already that you just looked at it and said, oh, I'm searching for Sure, that. sure. Man, absolutely. And that's, that's one of the reasons um, your story resonated with me. The, the whole, the way I found out about you was through Jeremy Horn, former UFC champion Jeremy Horn. Um, we're Facebook friends, and he, he, uh, he shared that video, the one that went viral. Wow. Where, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, this, this guy has my respect. This guy is making an an honest <laughs> assessment of martial arts. And I thought that was really interesting. So I, so I looked at it and I thought, you know what, he's, he's right. Because most 
most of these, um, how can I put this, traditional martial arts videos out there on the internet have an agenda. Mm. They're either trying to prove that it works or they're trying to prove that it's garbage. Yeah. And yours was not. You mm. took a very scientific approach. Let's see what happens when we apply pressure to it. Right. And that's it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's what garnered so much attention. People recognize something different there. Mm. So yeah, I took a look at that and, and it resonated with me because I went through something very, very similar. Mm. Um, my first martial art was Taekwondo, Olympic style Taekwondo. And I loved that. I did it for a very long time, about a decade, did a bunch of Taekwondo competitions. And it's something I felt I had a particular talent at. Mm. And when I made the transition to American kickboxing, which on paper sounds like a very similar sport. You punch and you kick. In Taekwondo, you punch and you kick, but with a, a few important differences. In Taekwondo, uh, WTF style, Olympic style Taekwondo, you don't punch the face. You can't punch the head. Yeah. And you also can't kick the legs. Mm. And to somebody who doesn't have that experience, that doesn't sound like an important difference until you actually get in the ring and you get punched in the face and kicked in the legs and beaten up a little bit. And you realize, I don't have this particular skill set. Yeah. All of this training that I convinced myself was, was so um, complete actually wasn't. Okay. So, I mean, I spent a lot of time with different traditional martial arts, Taekwondo, Shotokan Karate, Kapuera, if you can consider that a traditional martial art, Okinawan okay. Kobudo, um, you know, all the weapons and, and stuff like that. And it was fun, but at the same time, when we invest so much time into something, we, we want some type of return on that investment, some type of real world, tangible return that gets people's respect. Mm -hmm. And what gets people's respect more than winning fights, right? At least in the short term. Because that, that grabs attention. It gets people's eyeballs focused on us. And so, yeah. That was a wake-up call. My first professional kickboxing match was a big wake-up call, and I realized I, I have to go back to school. I, I really don't know as much about this as I thought I did. Uh, this needs to change. I need to throw a lot of this out in the garbage, and I need to assimilate a whole different set of skills. Mm. So I, I imagine that's, that's something like, uh, like what you experienced. Absolutely, yeah, of course. Uh, it makes me curious to ask. So, so two questions. One is a quick one. Uh, so, was that? I suppose that was in the states before you moved to China. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I started and, started competing in the U.S. Mm. And the next one is. It almost sounds like you you just threw yourself into the ring of a competitive match of kickboxing. Yeah. That, I went straight from amateur traditional martial arts competition, amateur taekwondo, to professional kickboxing. Oh wow! And, and I know that that sounds like a that sounds like a big jump, and it is. But you know, when you are delusional, and at the time I totally was, right. that doesn't seem like a big jump. When, when you have a, a black belt with a bunch of stripes on it in yeah. a traditional martial art, you've spent all this time, 10 years competing, you've done over 100 matches, which you've called fights. Mm. It doesn't sound like a big jump to go into a professional kickboxing. Sure. And I know that sounds really stupid saying that in retrospect I, from the outside. But when you're stuck with this, this tunnel vision, hmm. it, it sounds totally plausible. And I see a lot of this tunnel vision in YouTube comments mm -hmm. on, on uh, my videos and also your videos from people who, sure. who say, oh, well, you're just not doing it right or this or that yeah. or the other. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I kind of want to, you know, just toss them in a, a boxing ring and see what happens and be like, yeah, see how it is. But, you know, everybody should train, but not everybody needs to fight. I mean, I wish they could, but not everybody needs to. Not I everybody agree. should. I agree. Um, speaking about comments, uh, I'll, I'll get back to your story, but uh, I'm very interested to ask. Uh, you, you are, I, pres I would say, a, a controversial figure in the sense of martial arts, as, as I, I would say I am. And this, maybe you're a lighter version. Like sure. For a while, I was a bit heavy on the whole negative side of Aikido, so you know that's my mistake. But but then uh, I I'm aware that people, some people, have, as you said, they have strong beliefs, and you challenge those beliefs, and that creates that kind of 
uh, cognitive dissonance, anger, upsetness. So how sure. do you, how how is how's it for you to be exposed to all those comments and all those people who really disliked you and took it personally? Uh, was it easy, or did mm. you have to transform yourself? Or yeah, man, I've I've been going this through. I've been going through this for a long time. So at first, at first, when I was making that transition from um, traditional martial arts practice to to professional combat sports competition. Mm. There was there was so much negativity thrown my way, like so much. People would be like, "You suck!" From both ends, mm -hmm. from both ends, like people in combat sports were saying, "You suck! Get out! You don't belong here!" And people in the traditional martial arts community were disowning me, like, mm -hmm. "You you're not one of us anymore. You're one of them." Yeah. So there, there was a there's a us and them polarization that goes on, and I still see this going on in internet comment wars. Sadly, but um, yeah, hold on, I'm losing my train of thought. Yeah, I, I mean, just basically, how how is it, how is it right now uh, with or starting as you became a public figure and you started gaining following? Okay, right. Also positive and negative. Right now, how was that for you? Yeah, right. Right now, I mean, I I know how to deal with negative comments much much better than I did like 10, 15, 20 years ago. Hmm. Um, simply because I've been exposed to it so much. So, so now I, I just recently did a video, a series of videos where I, uh, I celebrated the 100,000 subscriber um, mark by, uh, by responding to a bunch of negative comments. So I collected all, all of the negative comments I got for like a month and uh, just read them and responded to them just, just on the fly to see, just to see what, what would happen. And, uh, and what I didn't realize at the time is that most of them were about my voice. And Interesting. <laughs> okay. I, I know, man, I know. And um, it, it was kind of funny because the voice is, is very much the reason I, I started YouTube in the first place because I, I had trouble communicating with people. I had trouble talking to people. I hated hearing the sound of my own voice. It, mm -hmm. it, um, it's something I really struggled with. Okay. Um, so to hear people on the online say, you have such a great speaking voice. That's awesome. Wish, I wish I could talk like you. And at the same time, angry people saying, I hate your voice. You sound pompous and arrogant or whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's funny to me now. It's, it's kind of hilarious in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, just, just found ways to, to laugh at the negativity and, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just turn it around, not, not make fun of them, but try to find a way to laugh with people about it. Yeah. So if, if you take anything personally, if you become emotionally invested in an attack, you're mm -hmm. losing. And that's, that's true in life and it's true in a fight. Right. Anger will carry you for a couple of seconds in a fight. Mm. And then after that, you are, you're on your own. It's up to, it's, it's up to, you know, whether or not you know how to fight whether or not you understand technique, how to carry yourself. If you're an athlete, if you train the right way, anger gets you into a fight, it puts you in the cage, it doesn't get you out. Mm. And it's the same thing with, uh, with personal interactions, online, offline. Somebody sends you an angry comment or gut wrench reaction, especially if we haven't experienced that thousands of times before, is to type angrily back, well, I'll show you, and you know, hit those buttons as hard as we can, trying to punch people through the keyboard. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work. It just escalates. It just makes it worse, makes people hate us. Mm. I mean, think about the worst angry comment you ever got on, on the internet. Did that make you like that person? No, no right? <laughs> Did that make you think, hey, this guy has a good point? Yeah, no. No, right? <laughs> Did that make, make you think, um, I have any respect at all for this person? No. To the contrary. And so if we, if we become that person and engage with them in that type of battle, again, we've lost. So I think going back to what you said about a controversial figure, I think um, a, a lot of the controversy comes from, from challenging um, popular figures. Um, mm -hmm. Take uh, Master Wong, for example. Yeah. Um, I did a, did a fairly lengthy segment with McDojo Life about this the other day. He had a bunch of questions mm -hmm. about Master Wong, but he's, he's, right. a, 
he's a popular YouTuber, very popular YouTuber. A lot of people respect him and, and like what he does. And, and I made this video a while back, uh, challenging the way he was performing a certain jujitsu technique. Yeah. And that it kind of exploded into this big controversy. And that, that kind of surprised me at first because I've made a bunch of these videos where, where we try out uh, techniques that don't work and try them live against real resistance. Yeah. And, um, but everybody celebrated that because, you know, the, the figures behind them didn't have that type of popularity. So uh, I think what this boils down to a lot is tribalism. And mm. we see this a lot in... Um, in martial arts as well, it's it's my tribe of um, Taekwondo versus your tribe of MMA or this tribe of Jeet Kune Do or whatever. Yeah, they've got names exactly like tribes. Um, let, let me ask you this: like, um, how how has tribalism factored into your experience with martial arts? Uh, well, I definitely was part of a tribe uh, in the days of Aikido, especially when I was a student. And uh, it, one of the things I feel heavy about is, I'll try to make it short, but, but was when I look back in retrospect, uh, the way my main Aikido instructor tribalized the whole thing, and it never, it never led to good results. I mean, it had small positive results, a lot of negative results, if, if like, to make a short, short kind of statement. So... Uh, yeah, I could definitely elaborate, but basically, yeah, it just makes makes the whole us versus them feeling and closed mindedness. And I mean, there's for me, exposure is such a big part of life. I mean, for me, exposure equals growth. And uh, tribalism is not necessarily very exposure like. So, so yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely a limit in so many ways. Yeah. Um. I just had this thought on the tip of my tongue. What was it? Master Wong, tribalism, martial arts, how it affects. Yeah, so some, something along those lines. <laughs> um, yeah, man, it was going to be a great one. Oh, damn hold, it. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I went yeah. too, too much of it. It's one of those times where we need to do a jump cut. No, not really, but um, yeah, so let's, let's just keep going with tribalism here. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Well, maybe I guess hopefully that that'll re refresh your your line of thought. Hopefully, but just the whole Master Wong. Uh, would you say he? I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's sure. quite a rabbit hole, man. His right. his fans love him to death. You know, respect to his fans. Um, they they are dedicated. They are some dedicated folks who will fight to the death <laughs> to defend their their Master Wong. Man, they love that guy. Well, that, that's interesting because that definitely sounds like a tribe. And uh, again, with pros and cons, I would focus more on the on the, the cons. But but that tribalism, uh, I have a feeling you you are not in your in your career as a coach or in your career as a public figure on YouTube. I presume oh, I remembered what I was going to say. Sorry, to cut you off. Go, go ahead. But, yeah. but coaching, I was going to say something about how how teaching online right. and teaching in person are dramatically different skill sets. Right. And when you try to teach somebody online, we often run into this, uh, these barriers, people questioning in the comments, well, what about this and this and this? Or they'll throw out insults at you, or, or they'll, they'll challenge you in some way. And dealing with that online is, it's, it's a process of back and forth and back and forth. It's correspondence. Whereas dealing with that in person, that's, that's, um, that's interesting to me. Generally, because um, this happens all the time, all the time, all the time in the gym, like somebody will come in, a new student, you, even, you know, one of my professional fighters, I'll, I'll, I'll show something, I'll show a game plan or a technique, and yeah. they'll question it. Well, what about this? What if this happens and this happens and this mm. happens? And what I always say in that situation is, well, let's try it out and see what happens. Right. Because... Yeah. My, my interest is not to, not to prove that I'm right. My interest is to make sure that my fighters have the best possible chance of winning that fight. Right. And the only thing that gives them that chance is the truth. Mm. And so I say, well, let's try it out and see what happens. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that, I'm not going to say shuts down the questions. It answers the questions right away. And that, that's an important distinction. Answer the questions instead of shut them down. 
Yeah. And that's one of the big problems with, um, that I had personally with traditional martial arts is the questions were shut down instead yes. of answered. Like, why do we do blocks this way and this way when I've never actually seen that in a real fight before? No, no, no. We don't talk about that here. We only do it. We don't talk about it. Yeah. 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 So You're, as yeah. a, uh, yeah, so, so. I know you've, you've, uh, um, I, I watched some of like your old Aikido videos where you would show like uh, instructional videos. And now I, it, it seems like your, your role as a YouTuber is more like uh, a questioner, like you, you're a, a truth seeker, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, and it's more so going out and asking other people, like, how would you do? Um, so I've, I've got to ask you, uh, um, with all the experience you had as a martial arts instructor in the past, um, how, how would you see yourself? How, how, how am I going to phrase this? Moving back into the role or, or, or changing that role as an instructor or a teacher or, or if ever you plan on doing that again? Does uh, that make sense? Yeah, I guess. Um, I think so. Um, so I guess there's two lines for me here. One, one of the thoughts it correlates to something I was having in the back of my mind as, as you were speaking. There's a there's a terminology I came up for myself to kind of navigate the whole challenging realm of, of martial arts. Uh, I, I, I phrased that there is explanation versus justification. That for me, I realized that in, in yeah. traditional martial arts, especially in Aikido, but also there's, uh, and I think, Master Wong is unfortunately, I, I think, guilty of that as well, in my personal opinion, that there's a lot of justification. It's instead of ex explanation is basically like what you said. It's explaining through both theory and experience of, oh, well, when this happens, it's a rash, kind of rational uh, scientific analyze, uh, analysis of what's happening, testing. And uh, on the other hand, justification is not heading into the questioning, not exploring deeply the subject but just trying to kind of fire away the kind of push away the the question or or just kind of throw something random out or or some prearranged line to to shut down the conversation and traditional martial arts are very much like that and for me i was i was always not necessarily always but but for a long time i was conscious of not uh, not being attached to justification too much I did that, unfortunately, because that's the culture of Aikido. But I remember at my first days of instructing, even Aikido, somebody would ask me, why do we do this? And I would throw out a justification that I took on from my instructor. And, uh, and the, the student asked me, so does it really make sense to you? And I stopped, because truth for me always was important. And I stopped and I asked myself, does this really make sense? And it didn't. And that started this process of asking, so so why do I say this? And years later, even at the end of my the last years of me teaching Aikido, that's where I think my teaching started breaking down. And I felt I could not do this anymore because I realized the real answers, the 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 explanations are, well, we do this because my sensei said so. Well, we do this because uh, because it looks nice or whatever, and it's just it's not worth it. Uh -huh. and, and these days, for me, if I imagine myself teaching again, absolutely, I would go through the method that, that you're going through as well, through, through exploring. And it's something I respected a lot from my MMA coach in, in Portland, where, where I trained for some months, is he would never say, this, never do this, or this is never going to happen, which is a common phrase in, in traditional martial arts. Oh, yeah. Right. Especially and, on the internet. Right. Yeah, exactly. They like to deal in absolutes. Exactly. And, and the way he would phrase it, he would say, it's not likely, or this doesn't happen often, but it's like, there's almost like always a chance that this may happen. It's like, it's not his place to say never. And I, I like yeah. that perspective. And then the coaches generally speak in terms of high percentage, low percentage, right, high exactly. risk, low reward, and so on, as exactly. opposed to this works, this doesn't. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to make sure that I'll I'll touch back uh, if you don't mind uh, that I'll touch back to your story again. Just yeah, yeah. So one of the things 
I wanted to ask is also what initially got you interested in martial arts? What was the motivation for uh, oh, joining man. it and how that evolved that, for years? <laughs> that, that is simple, man. I, I got bullied a lot when I was a kid. I got beaten up, just, you know, thrown on the floor and just stomped on by school bullies. And uh, I realized if I don't learn how to fight back, I, I could die. I mean, <laughs> these guys would probably kill me. Yeah. Um, I remember after one experience, I, I got so sick of being picked on by the school bully. I challenged him to a fight. I stood up in front of the whole class and I, I basically said, I'm sick of this. Uh, after school, in the park, be there. I didn't know anything about fighting. Like my whole fight experience came from like, um, um, like some old fight video game, Double Dragon. You ever played that one? That was, yeah, yeah. That was my entire exposure <laughs> to martial arts technique back then. Which, which means, you know, absolutely zero. But, you know, I was so mad. Like I said before, anger puts you in the cage. It doesn't get you out. It didn't matter, so I challenged him. And in my mind, I was playing this out. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do the other. After school, instead, at lunchtime, the school bully and his 15 friends jumped me outside the school, threw me on the ground, beat the crap out of me. And, uh, you know, sent me to the hospital. And afterwards, I thought, man, I, I need to do something. I have to do something. Now, I grew up in this really small town, small farming town. There was not a martial arts school within miles and miles and miles of where I lived. It just wasn't something that was possible. So I did the, the next best thing. I went to the closest library I could find, and I checked out all the books on martial arts I could find. And I got this big stack of books like all seven of the books they had because it's a small town small library and i opened up this book on karate because i had seen the karate kid and i knew okay it worked in the movie maybe it'll work in real life and on the very first page the intro of the book the guy says karate is not magic martial arts is not magic it requires hard work physical discipline exercise and i was like oh Oh, every one of these words, my heart sank like, no, no, I want magic. I want, <laughs> I want a magic pill. Make it go away, please. Right. But I'm glad that was the first book I picked up because even to this day, especially to this day, that message still sticks with me. And that is a message I train. I, I drill into my students' heads. Martial arts is not magic. It is hard work. It is discipline. It is exercise. It is do the work to get the result. There's no other way around it. So I studied these books. I practiced techniques with my brothers at home, gotten a few more scraps, got beaten up a little bit more. Um, and at one point, I remember in, in high school, the school bully came back and he, he said some snarky words and he came at me with a punch. And I just flinched and threw my hand up and just kind of flinched that punch out of the way and uh, this, was, this was really the first time in my life I'd ever really fought back. Mm. It wasn't even like a textbook technique, just like, ah, throw my hand up in the way, like something most people would naturally do anyway. And the school bully kind of backed off. He looks at his friends and he's like, whoa, Dewey's a fighter. Let's, let's get out of here. Ha, ha, ha. And I realized, oh, man, if I, only I had known it was that easy. If I, if I just stood up for myself instead of, you know, being a doormat, basically, yeah. that probably would have been enough. Yeah. But I loved martial arts and, and it was something I, I was really interested in. So when I went to, to college and found out that they offered martial arts classes, they're like a bunch of them. Like they had a Taekwondo club and Taekwondo classes and karate clubs and Kapwara clubs and Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. clubs and all this other stuff. I joined as many of those as I could and I... I kept training and training, and I'd, I signed up for all the martial arts classes I could possibly take, mm -hmm. uh, just trying to absorb all this knowledge and information. But the one I really stuck with the longest and, and uh, the most consistently was Taekwondo, mm -hmm. because quite frankly, it fit my body type. I'm, I'm tall, I'm, I think you got long, flexible, and so that, that's a body type that lends itself really well to Olympic Taekwondo. And when you're really good at one, it can become a crutch to blind you from everything that you're not good at. Mm. So I knew nothing about boxing. I knew nothing about grappling. I knew nothing about uh, the skill sets of fighting in the pocket or toe to toe, just like outside the pocket Taekwondo range, basically. Mm. But again, when you're good at something, it kind of blinds you to everything else. 
So again, I did Taekwondo for a very long time, about 10 years of that. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I even kept training in Taekwondo after I started, uh, um, you know, kickboxing and mixed martial arts on that. Just, it was something I enjoyed. It was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, even to this day, it's a fantastic sport. It's, it's got a bunch of problems, yeah. but you know, it's a fun sport and it's a great foot in the door for a lot of people to get into martial arts competitively. So I, I finished college and I, I kind of fell sh a little short of the American dream, which is, you know, you go to college, you get a good job, you, you buy a house and, and, and two cars and whatever. And, and it just didn't work out that way. I was having a really hard time finding gainful employment. So I was working like, like three minimum wage jobs, like right out of college, just trying to make ends meet. And, and it was tough. And, and um, I, I just needed a few extra dollars to make ends meet. And there was this, uh, this pro fighting show in Salt Lake City where I was, I was uh, living at the time. And they, uh, they had kickboxing matches and they had MMA matches and they had Muay Thai fights. Mm. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do kickboxing because they pay. And all I need is, is like 50 extra dollars a month. And these guys paid $50, exactly 50 US dollars to show and then 50 more to win. I was like, okay, if I at least show up, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make the money I need. Cool. So I, I just jumped in there out of financial desperation. I know $50 doesn't sound like a lot in today's money, but man, right. when, when you have nothing, that's a lot. Okay. So I went into my first kickboxing match, got my butt kicked for three rounds, you know, eked it out to the decision, went to the hospital, got my ear stitched back on because I got my left ear torn off in the middle of this fight. It was like hanging by a thread, bleeding all over the place. It was gross. And I remember sitting in the emergency room of this, uh, this hospital, about to get my ear stitched back on for like 30 minutes, just mulling over everything that happened like what just happened that was so different that was unlike anything i've ever experienced before i hated it and i loved it at the same time and i need again but i need to do it differently so i kept doing it i kept training with that i kept finding every person i could find who could teach me something i didn't know i realized right off the bat i needed to learn how to box because the first guy i fought was a boxer he was an amateur boxer with some karate experience and he just boxed me to death for three rounds man it was uh it was sad it was sad to watch i'm shocked to this day that the referee didn't stop it in the first round and call it a tko because that, that's how one-sided it was mm -hmm. but yeah i kept doing that i i kept kickboxing uh started feeling pretty comfortable kickboxing did some muay thai fights um and I was good with that. I, was, I thought, okay, I'm a stand-up fighter. This is my thing. This is my jam. That's all I'm ever going to do. Mm. And then at one point, oh, man, bless the internet. It's amazing. I got into an argument online. Okay. And this is part of the reason I don't. I, I try not to get into arguments online. But I got into arg an argument online with this guy who was an MMA fighter. He had a few pro fights. Um, and he challenged me. I don't know what we were arguing about. I can't even remember. It's an indication of how important that argument must have been, right? And he said, well, you're just a kickboxer. Uh, I'm an MMA fighter. I would destroy you in an MMA fight because you don't know how to grapple or whatever. And I thought, well, let's find out. I'm mm -hmm. pragmatic. Let's find out what happens. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for this MMA fight. I agreed to fight him. So we get in the cage. We go out there, we scrap. He lifts me up over his head and slams me. He breaks one of my feet. So I had a few broken bones in my foot. I'm high on adrenaline, uh, adrenaline hard word to say. Mm -hmm. So I don't really notice the pain at the time. I jump up, grab him in a front headlock and start throwing punches at his, punches at his liver until he drops. And then eventually the ref calls it after he taps to strikes. Oh. If you look at my sure dog record, it says guillotine choke. It wasn't. It was a front headlock and, and shots to the liver. And I thought, well, that wasn't too bad. I beat him. I've never trained in grappling. Don't know anything about wrestling or jujitsu. Okay. That's fine. Let's do it again. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem with winning when you don't know what you're doing. 
Yeah. And one thing I didn't realize at the time is the guy I fought, you know, he didn't really know what he was doing either. I got <laughs> lucky. And I, I didn't know it. I didn't know how lucky I got. So I signed up to do it again. I got pounced on by a wrestler, stomped out a little bit, dropped some elbows on my face. And I thought, oh, man, perhaps I should learn what grappling is. So, yeah, I've invested my life into that very deeply since then. Um, yeah, and thank goodness, thank goodness that guy pounced on me, dropped elbows on my head, put me in a position that uh, I knew nothing about because that was the real wake-up call that I needed. That is what compelled me to become a mixed martial artist, to get really serious about it. Mm. So not everybody needs that experience, uh, fortunately. Mm. <laughs> like you, for example, man, that um, you had your, your first MMA fight not too long ago. Yeah. Um, and awesome job. I, I know they didn't give you the, the decision. Yeah. I would have as a uh, professional <laughs> mixed martial arts judge. I've judged quite a few fights professionally um, on my unofficial scorecard. You, you won that fight. I'm actually making a video about that. Again, not, not to prove anything, more so just to, just to teach people about the judging process, how, how fights are judged according to modern criteria and so on. But I thought you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Especially, especially for a, a first-time fighter. Thank you. Um, let me ask you a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, of course. I, I, yeah. I, I know you're doing the interview, and I'm asking no, no, these questions I, I here. I think it would be a blast to, to have some exchanges. Um, yeah, so how, how, <laughs> how do you feel going into that fight? Oh, um, you know, it's, it's the one thing which is interesting is a lot of people asked me, so not, not only asked, but presumed that I was afraid, or just stuff like a common idea. Oh, you must have been really afraid. And interesting enough, I wasn't really afraid. Adrenaline obviously was there, but I, I used to do a lot of meditation. I worked a lot with my with, with my yeah. how my brain works, and I think I managed my fear as well, uh, which I think didn't was not a problem there in that way. So I wasn't necessarily afraid to step in there, which I think is usually the experience. But the com the main mistake was that I considered that I did. I I was overconfident. Uh, and because yeah. because the, the 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 other fighter, he was also part uh, participant of a program six month program, and I expected him to be at the same level as I am, which I think that was more or less the the case. But in with my teammates, I was in sparring in training, I was way up ahead of them, and so I thought, okay, I'll just really quickly deal with this guy, do a first round win, and that'll be it. And so I really exerted myself. I think he, he, he I, I rocked him. He, he, he. Oh yeah, you, you knocked him down in the first round. Like he dropped to a knee and, and that was, man, that was one of the, that was a beautiful moment in that fight, honestly. But yeah. <laughs> well, but uh, the, the, the thing also, I don't want to blame that as much, but, but we got, we were given amateur gloves, like sparring gloves. So the impact was also. Yeah, the big thick ones. Right, which I was not happy about, plus shin guards. Anyway, but then, uh, but then I exerted myself really badly, and by round two, I was exhausted. And round three, we were both exhausted, and I did my best. I pushed through to, like, complete exhaustion. Uh, but I also did it. Yeah, you helped thing. really well under exhaustion, especially oh. for the first time doing that. that was, was, I was very impressed with that. Thank you. Honestly, man, I've, I have watched so many first-time fighters, like thousands of first-time fighters, go at it over the, over the course of my life. And it is, uh, most of them don't look like that. Oh. oh man, most of them, the technique falls apart after 30 seconds. They go out wild and swing in nuts mm. and then never make it out of the first round. Right. So, you know, to, to maintain that level of composure from, from both of you guys, I was, I was impressed with, with uh, both fighters there. So, you know, congratulations to both of you there. Thank you. Yeah, on the chance your opponent's watching this. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> uh, well, but then, so, so an interesting part, for me also too was that uh so in the end i had the the loss by by the decision and and but many people said what you said that that was it was a it was a good first fight uh, but i i had nothing to compare it with and up to now it's it's such it's so great for me to hear it from you personally it kind of re yeah. kind of reassures that it was that way but but also too that's the reason i'm here in dublin because uh, i thought as I was, I was really nauseous after the fight. Like I was, yeah. my guts out for 20 hours straight. 
Oh man, that happens. I was at a jujitsu tournament yesterday. I, I got talked into competing in, in a jujitsu tournament while I was here in California. Oh, wow. I was watching some of the black belts compete and um, the dude who ended up winning like the, the, the tournament, um, he was about to puke right before, right before they announced the decision and his coach was like, do it after they announce the decision because if you vomit, that's automatic disqualification if you wow. vomit on the mat. Wow. So he gets his hand raised and then immediately runs off the mat and pukes on the side. And, <laughs> yeah. So it's, just had to throw that out there. Part of the game, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I was, and I, I was after the fight, I was hugging the, the, the bin and just puking my guts out. And I thought, I realized I, I lost. And I was so sure I will. I was so committed to winning. I was just like dedicated those six, the whole six months. I saw no reason to lose because I was, I was really focused on my training. But then the, the loss happened. And I was thinking, so maybe this is a sign that this is not for me or I had that internal dialogue. And then I stopped and I thought, you know what? This will not, if I will stop after this, I had, a, I had a feeling people might be happy that it happened, but I thought if I will stop after this, you know, what message am I giving to people? Like what message am I giving to myself? What's the narrative? And I realized this is not, this is not the way to go. I need to fight at least one more time, whether I win or lose the second time, but I have to do it again just to not define myself by a loss, just to not yeah. my practice because this happened. So, so the way it was a powerful kind of mm, experience of, pushing through uh, challenges, which I always enjoyed. So, but yeah, it was, it was quite, quite the experience. So, so yeah, but. Uh, yeah, man, that's awesome. Great to hear you're not one and done, man. Yeah, no, no, not at all. I, I, it's, it's interesting. And I'm actually curious about your opinion on this. Uh, so I'm turning 30 in two weeks. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, just to realize that. Yeah. But, so I'm turning 30 and this is kind of old for MMA from what I hear. But, uh, well, it's it's actually pretty close to the average age of a, a, a UFC fighter. I don't, I don't know about all the statistics of all MMA, but in the UFC, right. the average age of a competitor is 29 and a half years old. Oh, wow. that, that's the average. At, at least it was a couple of years ago when I checked. It might be a little different now. But right. Um, right. Yeah, I, a question I get a lot, probably the most on my, my Q&A is on my, my YouTube channel is, am I too old? to train or am I too old to compete? Am I too old for martial arts? Right. The answer of am I too old for martial arts is no, of course not. There's always some way you can, you can incorporate that into your life. But as far as competition, especially something as brutal as, as MMA, man, I, I know people in their 50s who are still competing professionally. I knew a guy who started competing in his 60s. Um, that's not the norm. It's obviously not the norm. Right. <laughs> um, 30, you know, you can do it. You can, you can absolutely do it. The question is, how far do you want to go? If you want to be a UFC champion of the world, hmm. that, that's probably going to be tough. If you right. want to be competitive, get some experience, do some amateur fights, maybe do a pro fight or two. Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to do that. Hmm. Something that surprises a lot of younger people is the science of strength. And um, strength is the precedent for, for all athletic attributes. Right. But here's, here's the fascinating thing about strength and age that a lot of people don't know. The peak levels of human strength are achievable between age 35 and 50 in adult human males. Oh, wow. I didn't know that either. Yeah, I know. This, this shocks people because mm. generally we see younger people playing sports. Right. Younger people fighting. Mm. And we, we don't often see guys between the ages of 35 and 50, you know, in the Olympics with the exception of um, wrestling, like Greco-Roman wrestling and weightlifting. But in those sports, we do. Because strength plays a, a key role, especially. Mm. But yeah, as you age, if you stay active, if you keep lifting, if you keep strength training, if you keep mm. working for it, it's not so much the muscles, but the connective tissue, the tendons, the ligaments that get stronger. A lot of people nickname it old man strength. <laughs> but it's a real thing. It's a totally real thing. Oh. So it, it's kind of shocking. I'm 40 years old now. Mm. I was at age 30. 
at age 30, I was much stronger than I was, uh, than I was in my 20s. And this shocked me. Um, uh, it doesn't shock me anymore because I understand the science behind it. Now, I was faster back then in a lot of ways. You know, I was better fit for Olympic Taekwondo, the things I was doing back then. Hmm. But now, yeah, it's um, as far as age 30, and if you are too old to compete, no, no, absolutely not. I, I saw what you were able to do back then. Hmm. And I would say you definitely have time to improve because hmm. time is the limiting factor hmm. in, in everything, especially combat sports. Right. Um, yeah, I was, you know, I, I, I got to throw this out there. Um, do, do you squat and deadlift? <laughs> uh... A little bit. I mean, I did. Uh, I think when I did Aikido, I used to get up, up and down so much, so many times that might have been, you know, equal. I, I, I asked this because because uh, I was looking at your legs in that fight and was like, whoa, Rokas has some monster quads, man. This guy must squat because it's it's something you don't see with like the gi pants on or the, or the, the Aikido right. pants and yeah. or whatever. It's like, man, this guy this guy has some stacked muscles on those thighs. That's a uh, that is pretty impressive. But that, that's one of the most important types of strength for combat sports. Mm. You know, the, the postural um, strength and the, the uh, foundational strength that you, you get from training your legs uh, mm. and how they connect to the rest of your body. So, yeah, if you are, if you are strength training the way that you should, if you, are, if you have a good strength and conditioning coach, you can extend your career by a decade. Man. And also if you're sparring the right way. I think right. um, Robbie Lawler is a great example for this. He had an interview a while ago was sparring, and he said, I don't spar anymore. And this shocked a lot of people because he's an absolute beast when he fights. Mm-hmm. I mean, he puts on like fight of the night performances in the UFC where, where both guys just walk away dripping with blood and, and it's disgusting and awesome at the same time. But, uh, but he said, I don't spar anymore. And, and you, you can watch him spar on YouTube. You can watch his spar sessions. And what by not spar anymore, he means he doesn't go hard. He doesn't fight in the gym. Right. right. He went on to say, I already know how to fight. Nobody's paying me to do it in the gym. So you see what he's doing in the gym. It's very technical. It's light. It's, it's very much like what I teach on my YouTube channel. Go light, go technical. But at the same time, you need the context of experience. And so it's really interesting that, that you mentioned that you, you had um, nothing to compare your first fight against so you didn't really know how to rate how you did, right. um, other than other people's opinions. I, I, uh, I tell all my students, which is, your first 10 fights are gonna suck. <laughs> Even, yeah, your first 10 fights are gonna suck. Right. And, and not that they're going to be bad fights or, or that you're necessarily going to make technical mistakes. You, you probably will, because you know, you're, you're figuring stuff out. But um, they're going to suck compared to what comes next. Mm. That's an important thing to remember. That opening phase, your first 10 fights, your amateur experience. And so amateur experience is so important for uh, mixed martial arts competition. So I'd recommend people you know, get amateur experience in any combat sport, which is part of the reason wrestlers do so well, because you know, by the time uh, the average high school wrestler in America finishes high school, they've They've done 50, 100, 200, this crazy number of, of wrestling matches. And they're not punching each other, but they're going hard. And it is hard work. And it is, it is a grind, man. It is a grind. So you know, these guys are, are well prepared for the type of pressure, psychological and physical, that they receive there. So if you can get like you know, 10 amateur competitions under your belt to acclimate to... to um, what's happening phys- physically and psychologically in, in the ring or in the cage, man, huge, huge bonus for, for a professional debut. Mm. So I don't know if you're ever planning on going pro. Well, what would you think about that uh, prospect? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, it's, uh, I'm kind of on the fence about that. Uh, I feel I, I keep shifting towards one side and the other. So for me, uh, what I give out out of myself to the world per se, uh, means a lot to me. That's like a core subject, and uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know, if, you know how visible that is, but every time I publish something, I always think, okay, so how will that impact other people? And uh, and I keep thinking about narrative of 
in a way to say my story, which which is a yeah. public story these days, especially the martial arts side of it. And uh, and and this the narrative of I'm 40 and I did like you know for so many years and like you know, it doesn't work, but then I'm shifting to to MMA and to potentially uh, work up to professional level in MMA, not to go and become a UFC fighter and as you said like you know win a UFC title. Not I think that is not not a consideration whatsoever, but but just like a professional fight, one or two fights good ones if i would be able to achieve that 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 attracts me that inspires me because i feel that would be an inspiring example of of how how easily i could mm, demote myself and think oh i'm 30 and it doesn't it's not worth it I, i'm not i wouldn't be able to do this but if i would be able to do this that would be an example that others could do too and uh, i think that's that that inspires me so again i guess i just need that kind of reassurance of feeling that I can do this not only through through theory but also yeah. through experience. But if if that's if that will pop up in my way and I will see like this is I will experience that this is doable, there's a big chance I'll I'll start leaning on that side of the fence. Well, that's that's a great way to word it. Train up to the professional level. Like even if you fight pro or not, I, I think everybody who is physically capable of doing so should be lucky enough to have that the experience of training up to the professional level in some form of athletics just mm -hmm. to understand you know how to live in their body at the highest level to understand um their human potential mm -hmm. because man we in in this society right now especially this world of technology and um and and focusing on on um the mind so much we forget that our mind is our body and our body is our mind they're connected Mm -hmm. Our brains are not a separate entity from, from you know, the rest of what they're connected to here, and so, and so when we fail to discipline the body, when we fail to reach our our physical potential, man, I think that limits so much of what happens in here in our heads, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, I, I could jump in here as well, unless you're still yeah. yeah. Okay, there's it's it's very interesting what you're saying, and and it resonates with my experience as well, which is one of the, uh, in it, to put a disclaimer, I'm in a way I'm very happy of what I, what happened to in my aikido career because that shaped me into who I am today, but there's some things sure. which I'm more upset about than the others, and that part of being upset is is that physical side, because in aikido there's the myth of strength does not matter. And uh, you actually, oh, you're, yeah, yeah. right, you, and you, you are, hear that on a lot of martial arts, even Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, probably especially Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Strength doesn't matter. Right, that's true. And you get on the mat with a brute, and he demolishes you with a lot of brute force. And yeah, anyway, right. go on. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you. And and so even in Aikido, it was actually discouraged to train physically because it was considered that it'll build muscle strength and that will create tension, and your technique will start to fail. And so I ignored that aspect. Well, I, I really enjoyed training physically in my teens. Through Aikido, I started neglecting that, lost a lot of weight, and became this kind of a yogi kind of body type. But then, uh, are you still there? I think. Oh. Still here. You're, you're still coming yeah. through clear. Okay, I'm still. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, I lost you for a moment. So, so, yeah, so I had this kind of body, yogi body type of body type. And then. Uh, I realized when I look back and I started training again physically lately and it just feels so good. It just feels, it feels different. It, it, as you, as you said, it kind of creates that link between the brain and the body. And it's, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, it makes almost, you a more complete human being. Right. Absolutely. And, and it's just all that nonsense about strength being a bad side or, or training physically, training with resistance being bad is I, I feel great when I train physically. It, I guess it creates all those endorphins and everything. I'll just like doing a long jog or doing some resistance training. It just feels great. You just feel alive and that uh, means you're moving. Yeah. So absolutely, man. I was in terrible shape when I was younger, just absolutely terrible okay. shape, but I didn't realize how bad it was <laughs> until after I started training until after I got fit. And then I looked back and I was like, how, how did I put up with that? 
how did I live like that? That's, that's nuts. <laughs> that is insane that anybody would accept that quality of life as, as normal. Yeah. I got a, an email from, from a YouTube viewer who, um, you know, thanked me for telling me in every single video, get out there and train. And so right. I was in my, my videos. Yeah. And he said that that motivated him so much just hearing get out there and train over and over again, watching my videos, that um, he started walking on a treadmill. And he was, he was an overweight guy and, and they had a treadmill at his work. And, and uh, he said people would laugh at him because nobody used the treadmill at work. It was kind of a joke. But he just kept doing it, kept doing it. And he started losing a bunch of weight and he started getting fit. And he started feeling really good. He said, I didn't expect to feel really good. I didn't expect like this feeling. It, it, it's amazing. It's like night and day. And, and I wanted to say like, yeah, yeah. Somebody else understands the other side of the coin. It's a, it's, I wish, I wish more people could understand it because they fear hard work because it's uncomfortable. It makes you sweat. It makes you hot and all of this stuff. But the the result once you experience it there's you would never want to go back to the alternative right right absolutely yeah yeah i agree that's my experience as well it's it just feels mind-blowing how i neglected that side and and I, how i was able to convince myself that it's not necessary and now it's just like there's no way back <laughs> anymore so i agree there's uh one one more thing i i really wanted to make sure i ask uh, while we have time together and that is, yeah. if you would describe what makes you tick these days, it's a, it's a question I love asking people who are, you know, who achieve something. Okay. Like that. So, so what would, what would you say makes you tick on all? What levels? makes me tick on right. all levels? Okay. Well, when you first said that I was thinking about as like, like a MMA coach, um, that sort of thing. And I'll answer that one first and then go back right. to the all levels part. Right. But as, as a coach, as a coach, it's, it's problem solving. Um, one of the reasons I became a coach, I started, I, I watched a ton of amateur level fights, like a ton of them, as many as I could see. Like I, like I told you, I watched all of these first time fighters and I was looking at all the mistakes they were making and just asking myself, well, how would you fix that? How, how can you do that better? How can you solve this problem? Yeah. And I started, you know, rolling this over in my mind and, and, um, I watched all these fights from this, uh, this fight show. The, it was called the Ultimate Combat Experience in, in uh, mm. Salt Lake City, Utah. And they put on a show every single week, a fight show every single week with like a, a stack card of like, like uh, eight to 12 fights. Mm. And, and a lot of these guys were really rough around the edges. They had, they had some good pros going at it, but the undercard fights, and some of these were just so rough around the edges. And I thought, how would I beat that guy? How would I beat this guy? How would I train somebody else to beat that guy? Mm. And I, uh, I bought some wrestling mats. I, I started my own, my own small gym. Mm. I, uh, I invited some people, put up an ad on Craigslist at first. So, hey, uh, anybody interested in figuring out how, how to fight? No charge, come train with me. And a, a few people did. And, and you know, we, we just spent a lot of time troubleshooting, figuring stuff out. And we, we eventually formed a fight team and some of these guys went off and became pro fighters and, and won some fights. And, and uh, I just kept doing it. I kept doing it because I, I loved the, uh, the question, how do we win this fight? Mm -hmm. Not just MMA fights and kickboxing matches, but all types of fights. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's like, if I were just to describe a talent I have, it's the ability to, to flip images around in my mind and see them at different angles with my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, that's something that's come in really, really handy as an MMA coach because I can see a situation, flip it around in different directions and figure out how to, how to untie that knot, if you will, or how to tie the knot, if you will, if that, whatever the case may be. Right. So, yeah, it's just something I've kept doing as a coach, something that still drives me to this day, trying to figure out you know, the answer to this problem. And because MMA is so dynamic, new problems and new questions keep rising. But as far as me, what, uh, what drives me? What drives Ramsey Dewey? Oh, man, we're getting <laughs> existential here. <laughs> <sighs> we're getting existential here. Um, oh, man, delving into man's search for happiness. Um, you know, there, there are... There are a lot of motivating and driving factors in my life. There's, there's my work, of course. There's my family, my, my kids. I've got two children. 
Mm-hmm. It's, uh, and that's a unique type of motivation. Like, um, seeing these, these tiny humans who, who depend on me and don't necessarily realize it yet. <laughs> um, and seeing them learn and progress in different ways. I had a, had a kind of an odd experience with my older daughter. Um, she's seven now. I've been trying to teach her in, in martial arts her whole life since she was a baby. I've been trying to train her with various degrees of success because little kids are very impatient learning martial arts and you have to turn it all into games. And, um, you know, after seven years, I feel like a bit of a failure because I see these YouTube videos of, uh, of you know, kids doing like backflips and crazy stuff like right. that, that kid doing Bruce Lee routines right. online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you should never compare yourself to other people. You should never compare your kids to other people. But then my wife went out and, and she bought my daughter a skateboard for her seventh birthday. Uh-huh. And she'd never touched a skateboard in her life, but she got on this thing and just started scooting around like a pro. Uh-huh. And so we took her to a, a professional skateboarder for lessons. And then she like goes down the half pipe, like on day one. I'm like, what the heck? Don't you need like years of training to do that? And she's like going on ramps and, and you know, and uh, man, I took her to, to Venice Beach to the pier. It's a, there are a lot of skateboarders who skate up and down doing tricks and stuff. And, mm-hmm. and so she's skating up and down Venice Beach, stopping and critiquing the other ones. Like you need to bend your knees this way. They're locked out too much. And I'm like, my seven-year-old is like critiquing adults on their technique. I'm like, this, this was a really interesting experience to me right. to see that I invested so much time and energy to teach her one thing mm-hmm. where her interest and her talents lied somewhere completely different. Right. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to give up teaching her martial arts, obviously not, because you know it, it, is, it is something I love and something I want to share with her. But at the same time, I, I couldn't be happier at the fact that uh, – that my kids are branching out into their their own ways of exploring physical culture in in ways that not only they're interested in but that they're talented in so that's uh when when you ask what makes me tick um it is intrinsically connected with what makes my kids tick right now Mm. Mm. so yeah Mm. there's there's more to it than that i'm sure but yeah that's a that is a massive part of it yeah, that, that definitely uh, resonates with, with something I, I am inspired. No kids yet, <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking about it. But anyway, the thing is, uh, the, the whole calling, this, I, I don't know if you ever heard about the hero's journey. Uh, it's, it's something that, yeah. that that concept I really enjoy. Like the movie exactly. trope of... Right, and it's it's like goes beyond movies as well. But, but, but the whole uh, idea that we all have a sense of purpose and we all have something to do and and there's that uh, the saying by by the guy who invented the concept of hero's journey he's he would say follow your bliss that was his main advice and by bliss he he meant what really drives you what really what you love and that eventually things will fall into place and and it'll become your your vocation and passion and, and purpose and it, it really proved to be true in my life and i see it happening in other people's lives and even when you were talking about yourself as an MMA coach it just it just already I, I could see those those lines of it, it it just seems like it's definitely your calling and and it's just so beautiful to listen to that uh, about that because it, it shows that it's not something you come up rationally of oh this pays good money so I will do that but rather this is really what your life is about oh man it, it really doesn't pay good money if, if you <laughs> love money Getting into martial arts to make money is the worst possible <laughs> decision, right. unless unless you're one of those super talented people who makes it to the top and makes a million bucks off a fight. But, but that's the rare exception, not the norm. But yeah, but still, I definitely didn't get into this for the money. Right, absolutely. And and, and for me, but that that also, that also is kind of beautiful because I feel that's for me the calling, the sense of purpose is always is it's ninety percent of it is not rational. It, on, a, on, a, on the paper, it does make sense, but it makes sense yeah. on the heart level. So it seems like it's one of those cases. And, and it's, it's such an interesting story that you, so I was already thinking about that. And you brought up the story of, of your daughter and such a beautiful story of, of showing that, as you said, like if, you, if you're passionate about something and even to your best um, effort, if that, the passion lies of a different person somewhere else, they will be talented at that, at that area. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah. 
it inspires that whole subject inspires me a lot. So that's very and cool. so something I've learned as a coach um, that my daughter taught me is that, uh, and it's something I always kind of knew, but it really came out with the skateboarding experience right. is that I can't teach people to be clones of me and I shouldn't. Sure. I want them to be, you know, them, uh, you know, the best version of them. That's, that's becoming an overplayed sentiment on, on the internet these days, but it's, it's true. Become the best version of you, you know? Um, I had an experience teaching, um, teaching one of my, one of my students who's a, a Ba Hua Jung Kung Fu guy. I made a few videos with him and I have been training with this guy for years and for a very long time, I was basically trying to train him to fight like me, like punch right. like this, move like this, grapple like right. this. And he seemed very resistant move wise to when, um, when he tried to move like me and it just, it just wasn't really working out for him. And I had this epiphany a while, a while back where, where, um, we, we just kind of did some free sparring and, and I said, basically, basically do what you want. And he kind of did what he wanted. And, uh, and it was way different than what I was teaching him to do, but a lot of it was working. A lot of it wasn't, but a lot of it was. And so I thought, well, let's, let's, let's approach this completely differently. Let's, um, let's focus on using the stuff that is working, the stuff that is uniquely you and, and improve upon that and, and make that fit into your game plan much better. And I, I don't know why it took me so long with this guy in particular uh, before this clicked. Like, oh yeah, help help this guy do what he's already good at but better. Right. Right. But man, that was that was uh, revolutionary to me. Probably just because Bagua just such a different style of movement than what I'm used to. Right. With right. other people, it's it's easy to figure out. Like, okay, I'm used to wrestling, so I know how to coach a wrestler. I'm used to boxing, I know how to coach a boxer. I'm used to Muay Thai, I know how to coach a Muay Thai fighter. But, but when you have somebody with a completely different movement style, it's foreign. So you've got to learn this foreign language, if you will. Right. Yeah. So movement I'll, I'll, is a language. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, I'll chip in quickly something as well. And, and hopefully I won't, I'm not going too deep here, but, but uh, just ref, reflecting. Let's go deep, focus. Let's go deep. Yeah, let's go deep. <laughs> so uh, as I was reflecting on what you're saying, it's, it reminds me a little bit of, of my relationship with my parents as, as I was finishing high school. Uh, it, you're supposed to study and in, in from the country I come from because you're just, it's a no questionable decision. doesn't matter what, but you have to study. And I didn't, I, I decided to become an Aikido instructor mm -hmm. and, and for them it was a big shock and they tried to talk me out of it for a couple of years until the decision time came. But but I, I realized that it was and they're great parents and and I realized it was an act of love. They were they were but they that was their perception of what works best. Uh, university is the best choice. And while it wasn't true for me, I proved it to be true that, that this path is much makes me happy and it works. But at that particular time, that was their expression of love. And it, it seems like we we tend to do that in those situations where whether it's our partner or brother, parents, friends, whatever, that we want, we have an idea of what works best. We have an idea of what worked for us and we expect that to work for others. But it's interesting to kind of go beyond that and to realize there's something more than that. It's, it's not as simple and plain as that. So. Yeah. And that's, that's cool. Mm. That is a, that's a fascinating life lesson, which reminds me of something um, I think about a lot going back to what makes, what, what makes me tick is, um, one of the reasons I invest so much time into martial arts and, and physical culture um, mm -hmm. and, and trying to tap human potential is that exactly. I've learned that the more, the more I learn about one thing, the more I learn about everything. Right. Yeah. Ha have you ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? No, it's, on my, it's definitely on my to-do list. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great read. It's, it's a fun book. Um, you know, there are some hilarious parts in there, but there, there's this, this part where there's a scientist, this super genius scientist who invents this machine that can make a, a copy of the universe by analyzing a piece of cake. It just scans the, the molecules in this piece of cake. And based on how the rest of the universe 
um, is pulling on it with gravity or hitting it with photons or whatever, it extrapolates the rest of the universe. And he makes like this, this carbon copy of the universe based on analyzing just a little piece of it to a very, very deep level. And even though the book is, is mostly, you know, funny and all that, I, that part stuck with me and I thought, huh, there's, there's something about that. There's something about that that resonates with me because that's exactly what I'm trying to do with martial arts. Mm. I, and at a macroscopic level, you can see that this is true. When you learn everything there is about martial arts, you learn something about coaching and teaching, ergo pedagogy. Um, you learn about human psychology. You learn about first aid. You learn about medicine. You learn about anatomy. You learn about kinesthesiology. You learn about all of these sciences that involve movement and health and fitness. Um, you learn about intrapersonal uh, connections. You learn about how to deal with other people, how to talk and communicate with other people. Um, and at the microscopic level, we can dig even deeper and see all these subtle nuances of things that we learn. But man, when you delve deep, and this is why I say let's go deep, because when you <laughs> delve deep into any subject, any subject at all, mm. it is surprising how much you can actually learn from that one little thing until you can extrapolate the universe, as it, as it were. Right. I agree. I definitely agree. And uh, it was interesting. I just actually mentioned that to, to the person I was talking to, to today, that uh, personally, I really enjoy trying to get to know as much as I can. And I realized that if I want to be an expert in a field, I need to mm -hmm. dig deep into that specific field. But there's that desire to, to look for similarities, to look for, for what you, for that kind of common thread, what unites things. And, and that was definitely my experience as well through life. As you mentioned, like looking at martial arts and taking them as this micro universe to the micro macro universe, and so yeah, that that makes absolute sense. To me. And and actually, one thing I'll, 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 I want to ask here as well is something I didn't. I I've obviously there's too many videos out there to watch them all, so I haven't watched all of your yeah. videos. So my I might. I, I got all. like 800 of them probably. Oh yeah, I actually have. Yeah, I have. I really have about 400 which is crazy anyway but uh the thing is yeah so I, I don't know if you ever touched that subject in your channel i definitely got but yeah. you have pictures of yourself being a headstand and some other crazy things so oh, yeah. where does that come in like what is that <laughs> are you doing yoga or something else um you know every time i see something that i can't do like physically <laughs> like some stunt I, I i start asking myself how do i do that how do i figure right. out how to do that and, and so one, one of those things was I want to learn how to do a headstand because I didn't know how to do it. And, and um, like going upside down is one of those things that frighten me a lot. It frightens a lot of people naturally. Yeah. So because our, our human instinct, our survival instinct kicks in and says, don't, don't do that. You might get killed, you might mm -hmm. break your neck. But you know what? It can be done. It can be done mm -hmm. safely. It mm -hmm. can be done with control. I want to learn how to do it. And mm -hmm. so I just, I just, um, tried and I tried and I tried and I, I didn't look up any tutorials or anything because I'm stubborn like that and I just figured I'm going to do this on my own. Eventually I figured out how to do headstands and, and, it, and it made me a lot stronger in a lot of interesting ways that I didn't realize it would. You know, core strength and, and all this stuff, postural strength. And um, I started uh, getting a lot more into gymnastic movement. And, and, and part of this is... Um, one of my old coaches, Mark Brewer, he's, um, he's a black belt under, under Ricky Lundell in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But uh, I trained with him a little when I lived in the U.S. And, and I've kept in touch with him uh, this, the whole time I've been in China. And uh, he, he's very outspoken about how important the way you warm up for Jiu-Jitsu is. Mm. And he would often say that the warm-ups at his gym were were more challenging than the workout at a lot of other gyms. Right. I, I would ask him, well, what are, what are you guys doing now? And he, he showed me his warm up, and, you know, sent me a detailed list. And it's a, it is a full gymnastics routine. I mean, they're doing, you know, basic tumbling all the way up to, you know, handsprings and backflips and all this stuff. And, and the interesting thing about Mark is I, I knew him when he was fat and out of shape. I knew him when he was not particularly athletic. When the idea of doing a backflip and a handspring and a full gymnastic, like that's crazy. 
Can't even imagine that guy doing it. And he went from that, you know, to being a world-class black belt who competes at the national level, uh, who, who can do all these crazy movements and, and um, you know, inspired me to incorporate that kind of training into my routine. And so I didn't question it. It was, it was I followed it, you know, like a traditional martial artist follows their coach at first, like, this is a good idea, so do it. So I started doing it. And then I, I started finding the answers of why, like, okay, this, I don't even have to seek for the answers. I'm getting them because when we train to move upside down, like I was mentioning, turning images upside down in my head as, as one of my, my coaching attributes, that made sense immediately. Like, oh, when we learn mastery over the human body, how to move it upside down, how to, how to do flips and round offs and cartwheels and whatever else. Not only do we become better athletes, we become so much better at movement. And movement is, is such an important thing to master. I mean, I, I should know this because I have a, a degree in modern dance, oh. which is all about moving in unique, interesting ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was one of the hardest things I ever, I ever did physically was try to earn a, a degree in modern dance in college. Man, that was crazy. So <laughs> I learned as an adult, Man, I learned as an adult, and one of my heroes, one of my all-time heroes is Martha Graham. She started dancing at the same age as I did, age 22. And most people say, that's, that's too late. You'll right. never get to the professional level at that age. You know, going back to your earlier question, is it too late at age 30? Right. And, uh, you know, Martha Graham, so, so inspiring. Um, you know, she coined that phrase, movement doesn't lie. And I love that so much because it's true in dance, it's true in martial arts. It's true in a basic conversation. I mean, read the, the work of Paul Ekman, um, Emotions Revealed, if you ever read that book about you know, the studies of facial expressions and, and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, but man, that was, a, that was a difficult process. That was more... when, I, when I started out, I, I was not used to moving. Hmm. athletically i wasn't wasn't used to moving like a dancer the average person does three movements they stand up they sit down they lie down and they walk to another chair where they sit down or walk to a bed where they lie down yeah like 90 percent of what most people do hmm. and when you start to expand on your movement vocabulary, mm. oh man, when you learn that language of movement, and you can learn that through martial arts, you can learn it through dance, you can learn it through a fusion of both. Shout out to all the capoeira practitioners out there. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, it is a beautiful thing. Like, man, you're, um, you're training over at um, where Conor McGregor trained with his coaches right now in Ireland right now, is that right? And yeah. you, have you heard Conor McGregor on movement? Man, that guy won't shut up about movement. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. I mean, he's absolutely right about that. Right. Um, love him or hate him, he's absolutely right about the movement because that is all fighting is. Fighting is moving around the spaces, through the spaces, in the spaces, and preposition involving space. That's what fighting is. Yeah. So, yeah, can't do too much of it. Right. True. It's it's something you remind me of. I had a conversation with a friend who's uh, uh, I, I'd say a very talented fighter, but he also knows science behind like sports science. So he knows all the intellectual uh, yeah. thing, thing, things around it. And the way he expressed or or kind of uh, defined uh, fighting for me, he said it's basically a game of tag, especially if you're talking about boxing or striking. You're just trying to tag with a fist another person and and you're moving in between and 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 he spoke a lot about the efficiency of movements and uh, that that he was criticizing that too many people or too many fighters they're stuck with certain patterns versus if you're if you're free in your movement you can still do you can and if you're efficient in your movement you can still perform the goal that you're there to do and that really inspired me that that really resonated with with what i'm inspired to explore and i guess uh, as as little as i know about ufc and everything it seems like connor probably in especially in this early stages was more or less an example of that where he's he had his own way of moving versus trying to copy some 
some type of movement motion and and trying to do that so yeah that, that definitely sounds very interesting to me and yeah, I'm trying to fit somebody else's mold that's a that's a hazard right sometimes it can work but yeah right uh well uh that's just one or next two more questions sure. uh but uh one more again i had to put it put out there is um the ticking one <laughs> i keep bothering you with it so you said mma personal life what about youtube youtube oh man no i i started my youtube channel to get more experience um, putting myself out there in front of people to overcome social anxiety basically okay to help yeah. myself uh, learn to how to speak better and that's that's evolved into basically you know a channel that is mostly about um, martial arts, coaching, MMA, that sort of thing, because that's what I was talking about. I, I decided I'm going to talk about something that I love. And, uh, you know, it's YouTube. It's, it's, it's not, not my main job. I mean, it's, it's something, something I enjoy, something I, I, I don't want to say I do it as a hobby because that sounds very dismissive of, mm -hmm of um, the importance that a lot of the viewers um, give to the experience that they get through my channel and the, the, the instruction or whatever it is that I'm doing that they like. But um, you know, I, I can't say I ever made a goal with YouTube, but I probably should. I probably should. And I'll tell you why, because there's a, anytime you have influence over other people, Anytime you have any meaningful level of influence over other people, you have a meaningful level of responsibility. I know that sounds like Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's the true, truth. Though. Man, I, I love Spider-Man, though. That was, I'm, a, I'm a big comic book nerd. got a big collection of comics out in storage somewhere. But uh, couldn't take them to China with me, sadly. Oh. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's the truth. When, when you have a way to communicate with a whole bunch of people. And this is a unique age and the fact that we can do that. You know, when, when, when I was a kid, only a few people, only movie stars and rock stars could be famous. And now almost anybody can garner a certain level of fame, yeah. like YouTube fame, 100,000 subscribers of fame or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that can be used to lift people up and push them in a positive direction and help them make a, uh, good life choices and it can also be abused horribly mm. like I, I tell the story a lot every time people ask about like how do you get a popular youtube channel because i feel like i i kind of lucked into it yeah. so I've, i had an unpopular youtube channel for 13 years <laughs> and then then about six months ago joe rogan the ufc commentator podcast guy shared one of my women's self-defense videos where oh. we try them out and have funny results yeah, and all of a sudden, of thousands and thousands of people started subscribing overnight, and I was like, "What? It is it is almost uh, almost sinful that any one man should wield that much power that with a click of the mouse button he can grant you a certain level of fame and notoriety." Right. But you know, at the same time, at the same time, I'd yeah, got to use that power responsibly. Mm. So. So right now I feel like it, it's up to me to, to try to pay that forward in, in, in a way to, um, to use the great power of YouTube partial fame in a responsible manner to, to help people out as much as possible. Mm. Um, I try not to overthink it, you know, just uh, um, what I did before, like Bruce Lee said, try to give an honest expression of self. I know a lot of a lot of people, a lot of Bruce Lee fans are angry at me because of a video I made uh, some time ago about you know who would win in a fight, Bruce Lee right. versus Muhammad Ali, and I basically yeah. said you know the guy who trained his whole life to actually fight would. Sorry, Bruce Lee fans, I, I love him. He's one of my personal heroes. He said a lot of very inspirational things that inspire me to this day, like this one. Hmm. And an honest expression of self is very hard to do, he said, and that that's that was his goal, and that's that's a worthy goal. That's a goal that all of us should try to have. So that's always what I try to do with my YouTube channel was an honest expression of self. You know, not Bruce Lee's honest expression of him, because that's not me, not anybody else but, but mine. And um, yeah, I, I think as, as long as any of us do that, 
you know, whatever power or influence we wield, even if it's just over a couple of people we come into contact with. Mm. Because all of us do, all of us have probably like 12 people out there in our sphere of influence that we actually have some, some real impact and influence over. Mm. You know, everybody, everybody out there has some type of influence over everybody else. And so we, we really need to, to use that stewardship wisely, if you will. Right. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking about is, is um, you know, how, how to uh, how to use that more wisely. I mean, I, I like making people laugh. I, I don't consider myself a comedian. Uh, some people do. <laughs> some people are like, ah, you're, you guys are a bunch of clowns, a bunch of comedians. All you do is make people laugh. But, you know, that's a, it's a form of communication. When you can make people laugh, you can make them pay attention. When you make them pay attention, you can help them to learn. Mm. So that's a, that's a very useful, useful um, teaching tool. Mm. Uh, humor. Mm. So that's, that's something I, 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 I try to do. I remember um, when I was like 11 years old, my school had a talent show. And I, I love stand-up comedy. I love it. I've never done it. I admire those that do. I'm going to do a podcast with a stand-up comic at Shanghai when I get back there. Mm. Um, but I decided I love stand-up comedy. It doesn't look that hard. I'm going to do that for the talent show. So here's what happened. I stood up in front of everybody thinking I would just start, you know, riffing and telling jokes or whatever. Cause I thought I'm a funny guy. I wasn't, <laughs> I had no act. I had no preparation. I didn't understand the business and I draw blank and I can't say anything. And I freeze and everybody's expecting me to say something funny and I can't. And I'm like, ah, and eventually I just waddle off the stage and hang my head in shame. And that's one of my big regrets in life. I, I've, I've always, and so that's, that's one thing I, I have invested some time into, into learning is, is how to make people laugh. And it's, it's not anything you can read a book about or, or, or study the science of it. I mean, you can try. People have written books about it, but it's one of those things you learn by communicating with people, you know, talking to people face to face mm. or, or, over the internet or whatever the, the medium is. Right. And it's a, it's a process of trial and error, but it's educational. It teaches you so much about who people are, how they think, how they feel, and how to, how to best reach them on a personal level, I think. Mm. Nice, nice. Uh, I think this will nicely lead into one single, most likely last question. Uh, and that is, a tough one again, since you said yeah. we, can do, we can go deep. <laughs> uh, it will be, so what, what would be your main message to people? Especially if, if, if this, if it could be, I could wrap it up in, in this interesting way. There's, there's this exercise I used to like to do. Uh, you know, if you could send a message to everyone uh, that you know everyone will listen to and consider deeply, doesn't matter, they will follow it, but they will definitely stop, look at it, think about it, what that message would be. And just, just it doesn't have to be anything complicated, but what would say is important for you that would reach okay. other people? Something I say a lot besides get out there and train, which is super important, and that is a message I like, is to ask questions. Hmm. Because if we, but first, we, we, we need context for those questions. We need experience. Mm. We need limitations, limiting experience. We need to run into a roadblock. Because without the limitations, we don't ask the right questions. And if we're not asking the questions, we never find the answers. I think one, one of the most important questions we can ask, going back to the hero's journey thing, is to put ourselves in the opposite role, put ourselves in the role of the antagonist rather than the mm. protagonist. Most of us see us as the protagonist in our own story. We see ourselves as the hero. Mm. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, except for when there is. Mm. And when there is is when we see ourselves as the infallible hero who can do nothing wrong, um, who is unquestionably right, and a lot of us fall into this trap, which is why we get into arguments on the Internet so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we are able to put ourselves in the opposite role, the role of the villain, if you will, the role of the guy who is in the wrong and ask ourselves, hey, maybe I am wrong. 
and I ask myself this every single time somebody sends me an angry comment or, or a comment questioning what I do. I, I ask myself, well, what if? What if he's right and what if I am wrong? Right. How do I approach that? Mm. And sometimes I have some brilliant learning moments from that. And sometimes the brilliant learning moment is nobody's right, nobody's wrong. Sometimes the brilliant moment is, hey, I was right this whole time. Cool. But if we question ourselves, ourselves, instead of everything around us, man, that is, that is where the real learning takes place. Right. So don't just question everything. Question yourself first before you question anything else. Mm. Mm. So if I'm going to throw out a central message for people to take away from this, yeah, there's, there's, there's a good one. Yeah, that is very good. Yeah, and and again, I won't, won't keep this for long, too much anymore. But but yeah, that definitely resonates with me as well. And and I feel that's if uh, I sometimes could consider what helped me get along where, where, where I got to. And I feel it is part of it is that what, what you just said is, is questioning yourself first. And I feel like maybe a better way to say that is I feel one of the biggest mistakes that a human being can do. And I try my best not to do it myself is when we put on responsibility on others in terms of uh, putting the blame on others. It's like, ah, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, it's their fault. It's that, it, yeah. it's that object's fault or whatever. Instead of asking, so what did I do wrong? Even if somebody lies oh, yeah. to me, you know, it makes it, it, it's easy to blame the other person and it kind of makes sense. You know, well, he lied, he did the bad thing. But, but the question is yeah. how the question, which will help me evolve and become better is how did I create the circumstances for that lie to happen? Or how, why did I believe that lie? And, there's just so much more yeah. that we can we can gain from, as you said, questioning ourselves versus just throwing the blame on on, on the other side. I think that's yeah, it's a very absolutely. Good and that's one of those one of those micro learning experiences that you can get from martial arts that right that I got from martial arts, which is that you can't always make that other person move the way you want them to move. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're too big and too strong. You cannot physically move them, but you can move yourself around them. Change yourself first, change your own position and take that as a metaphor for, for life. And man, that's uh, that's mind blowing in the application. You learn so much more from it's my fault. So yes. what now, instead of it's your fault. So, you, you know, you change the world for me. One of those is the, the attitude of a responsible adult. The other one is the attitude of a child who still has a great deal to learn. Right. Yeah. Very much. Wow. <laughs> well, cool. So, yeah. We we went pretty deep. I mean, yeah, we always in a, a chance to go deeper, but <laughs> that's, we scratched yeah. the surface in a, a few times, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that was cool. Well, again, it's just slowly wrapping this up. It's it's for me just looking at this whole narrative, as I like that word. Um, I noticed it's interesting. You, you, met, you spoke about that fame or, or, or that part of fame that, that is accessible to everyone these days. And it's kind of fascinating to look at how in these, in these circumstances that we live in, it is possible by pursuing your passion to start to develop a voice which reaches people. But, but what's also fascinating for me is that those voices start to connect through, through the ways the internet works. And one of those yeah. connections that I, that I was always enjoying is 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 being connected to you like looking at, at the questioning you do and and there we have different ways of doing that but also there's a lot of similarities and yeah it's it's interesting how the world is becoming smaller and and if you're pursuing some some path that those paths uh collide or intertwine and uh, it's nice and i'm happy that we're finally getting to talk about that <laughs> yeah absolutely man absolutely Mm -hmm. uh, blast that great firewall of China. Don't tell Big Brother. <laughs> no worries. Well, I do remember your invitation to China. I'll keep it in. Uh, I keep it on my list. <laughs> yeah, if you stop by Shanghai, let me know, man. Let me know. Absolutely. You're always welcome at the gym. Cool. Well, then, thank you very much for, for this great talk. Uh, I hope people will find as much benefit from it as I did. And um, yeah. yeah, 
I mean, go out there and train. Is that <laughs> absolutely? Yeah. Thanks for watching, folks. Now get out there and train. Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll click the absolutely. I'll, I'll click the recording button. The,